All right, so today we're going to talk just a little bit about implicit differentiation. But this is really just the chain rule, which you already know. Right? Okay, so I'm just going to work a couple of more examples of it. And then we're going to try to see a pattern in the way it works so that we can write down a quicker way to do it. Right? Which is, I alluded to this last week. So this will not take up the whole time, and afterwards we can talk about anything you want to. Right? Any kind of questions you have with the uh, midterm coming up. Go through. Right, so let's start with an example. Uh, let's say we're going to do we have a function, say 3x squared y minus sine of x y plus y to the one half equals, uh, let's say, x to the 3 minus, I don't, I don't want to use anything nasty up there. We'll just say x cubed plus y cubed. Nothing too nasty. And the question is, fine. dy dx, okay, which if we want to make things look a little simpler, we can always write dy dx as y prime. Okay. Y is a function of x, so y prime just means the derivative of y with respect to x. Okay. So to set up the nice trick for doing this, I want us to get into a habit. Okay. Here's the habit. Move everything to one side. Okay. So here you have an equation, something equals something else, and I want to take everything and move it to one side so that I'm left with something equaling zero. Okay. At first, this isn't going to make a whole lot of sense as to why we're doing this, but later on, you'll see that this is going to set things up quite. So if we do that, we can rewrite this as 3x squared y minus sine of x times y plus y to the 1 half. And then we have to subtract x cubed and y cubed. And we get something equaling 0. Okay, now, if we eventually want to compute a derivative, at some point we have to take a derivative. Okay, now seems like a good time. We have some long function, all right, really, it's really what's called an implicitly defined function. All right, so implicitly defined functions are when you're going to have powers of y or functions of y on one side also. Okay. And it equals zero. Okay, so whatever this expression is, it equals zero. So when we take a derivative, the derivative will also equal zero. Sure, you have a function equal to zero, you take the derivative, it's still zero. Okay, fine, so let's take a derivative. Well, how do we attack this? I have to use the product rule, right? Because I have two functions, x squared and y. Okay, okay so the product rule says, okay, the three just kind of sits on the outside. I do the derivative of x squared, which is 2x, times the other function, y, plus Okay, now I fix the x squared, and I take the derivative of y. What's the derivative of y? dy dx. dy dx, or if you like, y prime. Okay, so I just put y prime. Okay, the next one. I have to do a minus. Okay, now again, I have a product of functions. So I have to use the product rule. The derivative of sine is cosine times y 
plus, okay, now I fix the sign, and I have to take the derivative of y, which we already saw is y prime. Okay, now I go to the next one. I think I have y to the one half. What rule do I have to use to differentiate this? Power rule. Power rule and the chain rule, right? Because y is itself a function of x, right? I have a function of a function, or I write it this way, a function of a function. Okay? So the power rule says I'll get 1 half y to the negative 1 half, and the chain rule says I then have to multiply by y prime. Right? Chain rule says you do the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. Next comes the minus x cubed. What's the derivative of that? Minus 3x squared. Okay, then comes minus y cubed. What do I use for that? Okay, minus 3y squared times the derivative of y, right? I have to use the chain rule again. Okay. And this whole expression has to equal zero. It's a long expression. Can we zoom out? No, it's already zoomed. It's so long. Okay, now, I want to find y prime. Okay. So I'm looking, I have these nice y primes all over the place. And I want to isolate just that y prime. So this is just algebra now. We're solving for y prime. Okay? So here's the trick. Everything that doesn't have a y prime in it, we're going to throw on to the other side. Okay? Now, what are all the things that don't have a y prime in them? Well, I can look, right? I can visually see this thing, right? Well, right, this one. Uh, this one. Okay. Those don't have y primes. Okay. And those are exactly the ones where I took a derivative of the x part of the term and I didn't take the derivative of the y part of the term. Okay. So for instance, here I had used the product rule. And in the first case, I just differentiated the x part. And in the second part, I differentiated the y. And that's how I got a y prime. Okay. Same thing happened here. When I differentiated just the x part of the function, I didn't get a y prime, and when I differentiated the y part of the function, I did. Okay? Here there was no x, here I got an x and there was no y prime, and here there was no x and you get a y prime. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so I'm going to take everything without a y prime and throw it to the other side. So that's going to give me, okay, I have to make sure I expand all these, uh, you know, there's a 3, there's a minus 1, and so forth. So let's see, I get 3x squared y prime, and then I'm going to throw this up away, and I get minus, oh, I think I left a parenthesis off. I get minus sine of x y prime, and then I get here a plus a half y to the minus a half times y prime. Isn't that plus sine of x? Well, I had a minus here, so it became a minus sine of x times y prime. All right, so remember, I had minus this expression when I took the derivative, all right, both terms of the, the derivative coming from the product rule are going to get hit with a minus. Okay, that's going to x, so that'll move over, and then here I'm left with a minus 3y squared y prime. And this is going to equal, well, now I throw all the x's over. So here was a 6xy, so that becomes minus 6xy. Okay, that has y prime. Okay, here I get a minus cosine of x, so it becomes a plus cosine of x times y. Okay, that is y prime, that is y prime. Okay, this is a minus 3x squared, move it over, it becomes a plus 3x squared. Okay, now, each term on the left has a y prime in it. 
That's good because I'm trying to solve for y prime. So I factor out the y prime. I get y prime times 3x squared minus sine of x plus a half y to the minus a half minus 3y squared equals this other side. Minus 6xy plus cosine of x and y plus 3x squared. And how do I now solve for y prime? I just divide right, by everything next to the y prime. And so dy dx, or y prime, is equal to negative 6xy plus the cosine of x times y plus 3x squared divided by, now all this junk, 3x squared, oop, I think I, no, oh, that's right, minus sine of x uh, plus a half y to the minus a half minus 3y squared. Okay, so this is pretty nasty work, right? And look at all the work we had to do, and look at all the places we could have made an arithmetic mistake or an algebra mistake. Okay, so this is, I mean, it, it, it works, but somehow it's not optimal for test-taking conditions, right? I mean, who in here thinks they would get, you know, a minus sign mixed up in the process on a test, you know, exactly, right? Okay, luckily, there's a way to do this all at once. Okay, so you just write down the answer. You don't have to work through all the arithmetic. Okay, and the way to do it is to just take the process right, in your mind and do it all at once. Okay, so let's figure out what I mean by that. We implicitly differentiate. Okay, so we do the derivative. We subtract the x's to the other side, and then we divide by the y's. Okay, so the x's were the terms where we actually differentiated the x part, and the y's are where we differentiated the y part. Now, if I remember right, uh, there's, a, I mean, there's a band called Oasis. I don't know if you guys have heard of them. Okay, so they did a song about this, in fact. At least I think they did. It went something like, Implicitly differentiated. Move the x's over by subtracting. Then divide the y's to put them on the other side. It was something like that, I think. Okay, so. Uh, yes? Is that a problem? No. <laughs> Do we need it again? No, good. Yeah? No. Implicitly <laughs> differentiated. Subtract the x's over, then divide to get the y's on the other side. Everybody! Implicitly differentiated. Subtract the x's over, then divide to get the y's on the other side. Come on. All right, so it's the same thing every time you do this, right? Implicitly differentiate, subtract the x's over, divide by y's to get them on the other side. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that the derivative, dy dx, is given by three digits. It was like a constant. When I did it here, right, and I took the derivative of the x part, you got cosine, and then the y just stuck around, right? just like if it was a 2. When I use this symbol, okay, it's oftentimes pronounced del, I'm saying take the derivative, but anytime you see a variable, okay, like a y or a u or a w or a z or anything which is not an x, Pretend it's a constant. Okay? This is called a partial derivative. Okay? This is really a subject for calculus three, right? multivariable calculus. Okay? But we can, without introducing it formally, we can just use it. Okay, so what do we do? We subtracted the x derivatives and then we divided by the y derivatives. Right? 
So we just divide now by the partial derivative with respect to y, which means you treat the x like a constant. And look what happened, right? When we did the second part of the product rule on this term, okay, the x squared just stuck around because we differentiated the y part. We fixed the x squared part. Same thing here, right? The sine of x is just a constant. Okay, we just treated it like a constant. Okay? And of course, there's no other x's anywhere, so it's not a problem. Okay, so let's write down the answer just by using this formula. Okay? So, we have to put down a minus. We always start with a minus. And now we're going to differentiate with respect to x, meaning we treat everything not an x as a constant. Okay? So we take this function. We say, okay, if we're doing it with respect to x, y is just a constant. Okay, so it's just, you can pull it out. It's like 3y, that's your constant, times the derivative of x squared. Okay, so what's the derivative of 3x squared y? Y is 6x. It's going to be, yeah, exactly, right? You put the y in the front, you say, okay, now I have 6x times y. So I just put down a 6xy. Okay, now I go to the next term. I treat the y just as a constant. It's like a 2. Okay, what's the derivative of sine of x times a constant? Exactly, right? It's cosine of x times that constant, right? So it's going to be cosine of x times y. Minus cosine of x times y. Okay, this next one. Y to the 1 half. We're differentiating with respect to x, which means y is a constant. So what's the derivative? Yeah. Zero, right? It says y to the 1 half, but it's just a constant to the 1 half, right? It's still a constant, so the derivative is zero. You don't worry about it. Next term, minus x cubed. What's the derivative? Minus 3x squared. Let's write it down. Okay, last term, oh, it's a y cubed, right? It's just a constant again. So the derivative is zero. So we don't have to worry about it. Divided by, now we do the whole derivative again, but this time we treat x as a constant. Okay, y is now the variable. What's the derivative of 3x squared y? Remember, y is, y is now our variable, right? So it's just like we're differentiating with respect to x, right? The derivative of y would be? 3x squared. Yeah, if you have the 3x squared, right? It's just the constant. You have a constant times y. The derivative with respect to y is just the constant, 3x squared. So I put 3x squared. Okay. Next one. I don't understand that. All right, if this was 3y squared x, and I said, what's the derivative if y was a constant? You'd say, well, it's something times x, so it's just something, right? Well, now I'm doing it with respect to y. Okay? So I'm on this bottom half here, where I differentiate with respect to y. So now y is my variable, and x is a constant. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I just have 3x squared times y, so the derivative is 3x squared. Okay, and the next one, I have sine of x times y. And I'm differentiating with respect to y. So what's the derivative? It's just sine of x. So I put minus sine of x. Okay, the next one is y to the 1 half. Yeah, just use the power rule. 1 half y to the negative 1 half. And then the last, OK, then I have an x. What's the derivative of x cubed? Zero, all right, because we're doing it with respect to y. And the last one is y cubed, and that becomes 3y squared. I get minus 3y squared. Okay, now look at the answer that we got, and look at the one we got before. The only difference, right, is here there's a minus outside, and here there's a minus up top, but I can fix that easily by making that a minus plus plus, okay, just by distributing. So you can see that the, the value of this method is you're taking all the work you're doing and you're abstracting it and saying, wait, 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 hold on a second. I keep doing the same process every time. Is there some way to, to just do it all at once? And yeah, there is. Okay? You differentiate treating y as a constant and then differentiate treating x as a constant. Divide them. Okay, now a word of caution. This works when you have two variables, x and y. But there's nothing to stop me from coming up with some sort of relation where I have a third variable, right? I could have a u, a v, a w. You could 
Okay, and then of course this formula doesn't work so nicely anymore because you you don't just have these two things. So you'd have to do that. You'd have to work that out in more detail. But still, I mean, this is this is really slick. Okay, let's do. On the midterms, are going to be like three variable differentiation. Uh, I, I I'd rather not answer that question at the moment. Because I don't. How would you do that though? Okay. Would you make two variables and set one is like why prime? That's an excellent question. Let's look at it. Okay. Uh, let's say we well, let's do something very simple. Okay, so here y and z are functions of x. So I could ask a lot of different questions. I could ask, what is dy dx? I could ask, what is dz dx? If I really was mean, I could ask, what's dy dz or dz dy? Okay, so I could ask these questions. Okay, so how do you have to attack these things? Well, you have to use the chain rule again, right? And of course, here you have to use the product rule. To, to attack these. So, for instance, if we take the derivative of x, y, z, that's three functions multiplied together. You remember the rule when you had more than two product in a product, right? You fix two of them and differentiate the third. And then fix a different one, or fix a different two and differentiate the third. And then fix a different two and differentiate the third. And you have three terms. Okay? So the first one, let's say, we'll fix y and z and you differentiate x. And we'll do everything with respect to x here, right? So derivative of x is 1, so you get y, z. Plus, okay, now we'll fix x and z. All right? And then multiply by the derivative, uh, and by the derivative of y. So you get x, z, y prime. Okay, now we'll fix x and y and take the derivative of z. To z prime. Okay? And this is all equal to 0. And if we're looking for dy dx, then we have to solve for y prime. Okay, well, we just put everything not a y prime on one side, and everything with y prime on the other side. Okay. Divide by the coefficient in front of the y prime, and you get y prime equals minus yz minus xy prime divided by xz. And without knowing what x or y and z are, of course, you can't say anymore. But this certainly works, right? This is dy dx. You can see that the change of y with respect to x actually depends upon z. But it, I mean, this is what starts happening when you allow a lot more variables into your equation, right? Things get more complicated. Ultimately, more rewarding and more realistic. Because it turns out in the real world, single variable calculus is just not good enough. Usually things have more than one input, right? There's more than one independent variable you have to worry about. And very often more than one dependent. All right, let's do another example, just of using this method. And it'll be much faster than the first one, because now you can just use the formula. And you can see, it doesn't matter. I can make it as complicated as I like. It's, it's not so hard. And so let's say you have 2xe to the y plus sine of x squared plus uh, y times cosine of y minus 3x equals 0. Okay, so I've already hidden in here that I'm putting everything on one side. Okay, so I did that step for you. And you want to find dy dx.
Okay, so I can use my formula. Okay. First part of the formula is very easy. I write down a minus sign. Okay. Remember where the minus sign came from? It was subtracting over the derivatives of the x's. Okay. And of course, that's the next thing we have to put down are the derivatives of the x's. Okay, so let's differentiate, differentiate this. Where what's a constant? Four. Y is a constant, right? So what about e to the y? It's a, it's a constant, right? So when I differentiate this, what do I get? 2, two e to the y. Right? The x is my variable, right? And the derivative of x is just 1, so that goes away. I just get 2e to the y. Okay, now I'm going to do this one. Okay, now let's see. I'm doing it with respect to x. So this y is just a constant. So it's like x squared plus 1. Okay. So what rule do I have to use on this? Chain rule. Okay. So I get what? Okay, the derivative of the inside, or the outside is derivative of sine, which is cosine. And I just leave the inside the same. Times the derivative of the inside. 2x. Which is 2x. Notice this cosine of y doesn't hurt me because it was just a constant, so I just can leave it. I didn't have to use the product rule. Then I get to this last step, and I have derivative of minus 3x, which is going to be minus 3. Okay. okay, now I go back and I do the whole derivative again, but this time y is my variable and x is my constant. Okay, so x is a constant, so this 2x is just going to be left. What's the derivative of e to the y? Yeah. E to the y. So I just get left with the same thing, 2x e to the y. Plus, OK, now I will have to use the product rule. right? Because I have two functions of y. OK, so first I have to differentiate, say, this one. I get cosine of x squared plus y times the derivative of the inside. What's the derivative now of x squared plus y? One. It's just 1, right? The x squared is a constant. That goes away. Derivative of y is 1. Okay, times cosine of y. Okay, plus, okay, now I need to do the derivative. I could, well, I can fix that. And then I have to do the derivative of cosine of y, which is oh, minus sine. Minus sine. Okay, so that means I'm going to actually get a minus sign here. Okay. And then the last term is a minus 3x, and the derivative of that will be? Minus 3x. It'll actually be 0, because x we're treating as a constant. Okay. The derivative of constant. OK, and there's your answer. And we, we did no work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you, you can't even show work when you do it this way. You just write down the answer. OK, my, my, the, the old calculus teacher in high school hated me for yeah. Can you explain why we, um, why we don't use the product rule? Uh, where? Here? Yeah. Okay, on the top, I imagine. You mean? Because now, this is a constant. Right? Y is just a constant when we differentiate with respect to x. So it's just like a 2. Right? So we just throw it in at the end. Okay. Right. If you choose to use this method on your midterm exam, which is quite okay, write down this formula with it so that I know that's what you're doing. Right? Otherwise, I have no idea if you're just guessing or if you, I mean, because, okay, you could still make a mistake doing this, okay? And if you make a mistake and now there's no work, how can I give you partial credit? Yeah, okay, so at least write down the formula that you're using, okay? Very good, very good. Any questions about this? Yeah, Colin. Is there a way to use it if there's, like, no y's, can we use it just like, I mean, it needs, there needs to be two variables in. Yeah, I mean, what, what, okay, so let's think about this formula here. You're supposed to subtract the derivatives of the x's and then divide by the derivatives of the y's. But if there's no derivatives of the y's, then, then you just get what? Well, you should actually, you, maybe the gut instinct to say, well, zero, because there's none of them. But it's actually one, right? Because you just have one y prime on one side. Right? So if I write y 
as some function of x. Okay, well, the first rule I said is put everything on one side. Okay, so you might say, okay, fine, I have y minus f of x equals zero. Now when I differentiate, I get y prime minus f prime equals zero. Okay, and then, of course, I put all the things without a y prime on one side, and I just get y prime equals f prime of x. Okay, which is, of course, you know, from here, that's what you would get. Yeah, exactly. It's not surprising. That's a, that is such a me thing to say. Okay, so there's no, there's really no adv advantage to it because all you'd be saying is, well, this formula would be telling you, uh, okay, how would you, how would you do it from here if you use this formula? All right, you'd say, okay, first go through and differentiate. Okay, well, okay. you get dy dx equals minus. Now you do the derivative with respect to x, so the y goes away, and you get minus f prime of x. Then you divide by the derivative of y, which is right, like 1, right, when, with respect to y. And of course now you have minus minus and you get a plus. So you haven't, uh, you haven't helped yourself any. So it's not that you can't use it, it's that it's uh, overly complicated. Yeah, it's like beating a snake with your garden hose. Okay. So, any questions about this? Is that the wrong expression, or is it supposed to be beating a, your garden hose with a snake? Never heard that. Before. Never. Really? Yeah. Huh. Never. Interesting. Okay. Any questions about this? No. Okay. Let's see. Oh, perfect. So, uh, so feel free to use this method. I, I, I think it's shorter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Google's also never heard of it. <laughs> I love this. I can make up nonsensical expressions and they can be shot down as being bunk within moments. What a time to be alive. <laughs> yeah, it's not on the internet. Place, it's like... <laughs> I know that's not true. You guys haven't seen the pictures of me. I mean, not those kind of pictures. The other kind of pictures. Oh, that's probably not, that, that it probably made you think the wrong thing. No, not that kind of pictures. The other kind of pictures. <sighs> I'm not figuring out how to say this properly. <sighs> okay, so at this point, I am not going to introduce anything new before the midterm. So you now know everything that you need to know for the midterm. Okay. I'm not going to throw any weird curveballs at you. It's going to be straightforward. Do you know this stuff? I can throw curveballs at you, but I'm more of a fastball pitcher. I did. Oh, did you want one too? Yes, I did. Boy, would have been nice if you, you know, showed up on time, huh? It'd be nice if the train showed up on time. The train showed up on time. Everybody has an excuse. That's why I take the eight o'clock train every morning. It's because I can't be late for you guys. Okay, so if you want to ask questions, now's a good time. Right? You want to find out what's going to be on the midterm? Well, I told you the last uh, you know, few weeks. Uh, but if you, I mean, you want to ask questions, substantial questions about how to do problems, anything you want, please ask. It'll be good to, we'll have some good work problems for the video. Uh, a lot of you asked me for examples, so you have anything you want to see. How? Is there anything we should check about an equation before trying to uh, find a derivative? Like, are you going to trick us with some equations that don't have derivatives? Good question. Good question. That's a curve. What's that? So that's a curve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so for instance, if I gave you a function like uh, this and said, what's the derivative?
what what's going to be a problem for this? Perhaps zero, right? Now we haven't proved that this function doesn't have a derivative at zero. If you drop the sign, right, then we know for sure that it doesn't have a derivative at zero. With the sign, who knows? Maybe it you know somehow smooths it out a little bit. It turns out it doesn't. It turns out that the sine function is going to be just as bad with an absolute value on the inside as it's just absolute value less. Uh, so, you know, you, you always want to look at a function and say, does this make sense? Am I always going to be able to find a derivative? If, if I'm asking you to evaluate the derivative at a point, does the function even exist at that point? Right? And of course, this is you know, something good to, to always check. Uh, another reason why you want to check is, well, I always believe you should think when you see a problem, right? Before you actually just start doing it, you should think a little bit. And for instance, you remember in the, this homework problem where we had, uh, I don't know, anybody have that last homework sheet with them? Oh, yeah, right? You, know, you have, well, I was writing something up, right? You might have something like sine of secant inverse of cotangent of e to the ln of cotangent inverse of secant of arc sine of x. Right? And I say, fine, the derivative. Huh? This may be Am I missing some? Four, five, six, seven, four, five. <laughs> you know, we have exponential notation for multiplying too many times. I need parenthetical notation for as many parentheses as I need. I like that, parenthetical notation. All right, so how would you find the derivative of this? All right, late, yell out the answer. Why? Why? That's really quick that you can figure that out. Why could you figure that out so quick? They all cancel out. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so you see, if you look at this problem, right, oh, this looks hideous, absolutely hideous, right? But then if you kind of peek around at it, you go, wait a second, there's an E and an LN. All right? Those are inverse functions. So they're going to cancel out. This is the same as the derivative of sine of secant inverse of cotangent of cotangent inverse of secant of arc sine of x. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, and then from here you go, oh, wait a second, now I see what's going on. The cotangents and the cotangent inverse are in there, they cancel out. Then I have a secant inverse and a secant, ha, ah, ha, 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 and then I have a sine and an arc sine. And I'm just left with the derivative of x. So. This is one where it pays to look at the function first. <laughs> so look for that sort of thing. I'm not saying this problem will be on the test. I'm just saying, you know, always look at the function and, and make sure everything, you know, looks right. That it's not going to, you know, automatically simplify. Hey, I make mistakes sometimes. In fact, I found a problem just yesterday that it was a piecewise defined function that was on the midterm, and uh, there was a, a mistake in it. It happens. It was your fault, though. Just so you know, I don't make mistakes with my fault. Well, they're infallible. Absolutely. Everything I do is absolutely perfect. All right. More questions. You know, when you multiply by a conjugate? Yeah, that's what I meant. Okay. Let's, let's try one of those. All right, so let's try, I, I have to make one up, so uh, I can only hope that it, it works. Uh, we'll try the limit as x goes to 2 
of uh, the square root of x plus 2 minus 2, and on top we'll have x squared uh, minus x minus 2. I just made this up on the spot, so this might just fail miserably. But let's see what happens. If you try to plug a 2 into the bottom, right, you're going to get the square root of 4, which is 2, minus 2, which is 0. Okay, so this fun the, the, the value 2 is not in the domain, so you can't just plug it in. So, Stephanie's question suggests the intended solution, which is to multiply top and bottom by the conjugate of the denominator. See if this does anything nice. Okay. Might not, but at least the method, right? You see, you would immediately have to do. Okay, so on top, ooh, we get nasty. So let's do the bottom first, because that's easy. All right, on the bottom we get x plus two minus four. Hmm. Plus two minus four. That's right. So we're going to get x plus two from the first term, right? Because we do these two squared, it just becomes x plus two, and then we're going to get minus four. Uh-oh, oh. that's not good. <laughs> All coming crashing down on you. All right, so we already see we're, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, all right, so that's going to end up being x minus 2, which seems to already be worse. But okay, let, 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 we'll figure out the top. Maybe something nice happens. Yeah. Let's we'll just see. All right, so you get x squared times square root of x plus 2. Okay, and then we get 2x squared, and then we have minus x times square root of x plus 2, and then we have minus uh, 2x, and then we have minus 2 square root of x plus 2, and we have minus 4. Oh dear. Oh dear. Okay. I'm not encouraged. Yeah? If I factor x, uh, x squared minus x minus 2, X squared. The factor of x minus two. Factor. Then it cancels with the denominator. Okay. So let's see. This is going to be x minus two times x plus one. Yeah. That'll work better. But do I? So do I have that? Denominator is x minus two. Yeah, but I don't have this in the top anymore. Well, I sort of do. I have two x squared minus two x minus four. All right. So okay. Let's rewrite this. I'll show you, but we're, we're still have a problem. The top becomes, all right, let me just actually just write all the things in front of the x, square root of x plus 2. Maybe, uh, actually, yeah, maybe this works out nicely. Okay, so you get x squared minus x minus 2 times the square root of x plus 2. All right, those are the first, third, and fifth terms. And then the other one, you get a 2x squared a minus 2x and a minus 4. Each of those has a 2, which I can factor out. So we get a plus 2 times x squared minus x minus 2. Now I'm asking, why in the world did I even expand any of this? <laughs> if I just left it like this in the first place, I wouldn't have had any problems. We actually could have factored right away. Okay, okay. but we don't know that, right? We just worked it naively. Okay, so if we factor out this first and I mean these two terms, right, you're exactly back to multiplying this times this. Okay, fine. So we'll just rewrite it like that. And sometimes you do the right thing and you get back where you started. And that's okay. So you have x squared minus x minus 2 times the square root of x plus 2 plus 2 over x minus 2. And now as Hussein pointed out, this factors is x minus 2 times x plus 1. So x minus 2 times x plus 1 times the square root of x plus 2 plus 2 
over x minus 2. All right, and now the x minus 2s will cancel. And we get x plus 1 times the square root of x plus 2 plus 2. And now there is no domain problem, right? These are all continuous functions, so I can just plug 2 in. And so I get 3 times, okay, that's a 4, square root is 2, plus 2 is 4. So the answer is 12. Phew! I love when ad hoc examples work out correctly. Okay, but we could have actually saved all these steps if we had just multiplied and then went right to this. We actually can go right here. All this stuff was garbage. Okay. But you don't know that ahead of time. I mean, this is the problem with mathematics, right? If this is how we worked it, right? We did it very naively. But that's, I mean, how else can you do it, right? Okay, so you go through and you do it naively, and then you figure out, oh wait, we could have just went from right to here to here. And then when you write it up and you publish a paper, you just write this. And everybody thinks, now how did you know not to multiply it out? That's because you did. <laughs> it didn't work. Is that uh, completely confusing, everything? Yeah, but... Okay. <laughs> Let's erase something. Alright, we started with just this, and a limit. We tried to immediately plug in 2, and we saw we can't do that, because we have 0 on the bottom. Yeah? So we said, okay, fine, there's a standard trick whenever you are in these limit situations and you see a, new, a denominator which is going to zero and you have something minus something, right? Especially when the something over here is a square root, it seems, but it doesn't need to be. Then the trick seems to be to multiply by the conjugate, top and bottom. Yeah? Happy about that? Everybody happy about that? Okay, fine. From here, well, if you multiply the denominators, you get x minus 2. Okay? That's not so tricky, right? We're just utilizing the whole a minus b times a plus b equals a squared minus b squared difference of squares formula. Okay? Fine. On top, well, if we just don't do anything except write them next to each other, then we're actually in much better shape than if we expand it out. Okay. Why are we in much better shape? And if we expand it out, well, it turns out that expanding it out just leads you back to putting it back into this form. Well, how can it be x minus 2 because we did it? Then we have the negative 2 and 2 and 2 and 4. Okay, so the square is x plus 2 squared minus 2 squared. x plus 2 square root squared is just x plus 2. 2 squared is 4. Oh, okay. x plus 2 minus 4 is x minus 2. Huh. Do we expect problems like this to come out this nice on the midterm? I don't write problems that come out ugly. Okay, cool. Even on the homework, did you notice every single problem just was beautiful in the end? Just had amazing answers? No, I'm not putting anything on there that's supposed to test your ability to massage equations and, you know, be an accountant. Yeah? I want to know if you can find limits, take derivatives. Yeah. When, you know, here's the thing. In the real world, either things are usually pretty easy or they're so complicated that you just need to know in theory what's going on and how to plug it into a computer algebra system. Right, like a maple or a Mathematica or something. You plug it in and boom, it'll compute I mean, some nasty derivative or limits or something. I mean, that's, I mean, this is one of the problems, right? Problems are either completely trivial or they're beyond what you really have the time to do. So I'm not testing your ability to, uh, to keep track of numbers running across the page. And there's no much time to think about it. 
It, well, it depends on you know how fast you are. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I did your your midterm last night. You know, it took me seven minutes. That gives me lots of time to think. Okay. All right. So, w was this the only issue you had, Stephanie? Was the x minus two? Yeah. Oh, okay. So then, from there, right, we're just factoring. Um, I'd like to show you, uh, I just answered the question you just... Uh, oh, this one? No, no, uh, 2x e to the y plus sign. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a different way, but... Oh, yeah, I mean, there, there's the standard way that we do this, right? The one that I taught using the chain rule, where you have y primes popping up everywhere. Yeah, yeah okay, so that's, that's what you missed in oh. the first half hour is... I gave an alternative approach which utilizes the methodology of the first approach but does it all at once. Both, both ways are acceptable ways. Okay, but, yeah, okay, so this is why if you come late, yeah. you get out of sorts. Are there gonna be any like, like order problems type things? Word problems? Not like, do you know? You like, said word or worm? <laughs> word. Okay, good, good. Yeah, there are no worm, I could make a word problem about worms if you'd like. No, that's okay. <laughs> Then why'd you bring up worms? I didn't. I said word. Okay. Uh, yeah. Word problem. No, I mean, there's nothing. I, I, to me, the word problems are part of the applied part of the course, which is what comes after yeah. the midterm. Okay. So, you know, these are. I'm really focusing on. Can you take a limit? Can you find a derivative? That's it. And you know what these things mean. Okay. So there's. Uh, when I said that the homework problems are the best. You know, represent representatives for midterm problems. I'm, I'm not lying to you. Well, some of them had word problems like that. I guess. Some of them. Oh, like that's, that's. I guess there was. One. There was like that one on the circle. Yeah. Okay. There's nothing. There's nothing on there that's going to make you think. Uh, in a, like, oh wow, that's really cool. Right. Okay? There's no, nothing like that on this test. Okay. That's for the second half of the course. Uh, th there's one problem on it. Well, it's three actually because it's three parts. Uh, that asks you to explain certain concepts. So that's probably the only part of it that's written, not. What's that? Writing. Yeah, it's actually, you know, explain this concept. And when I write explain this concept, I don't mean, you know, give me the precise mathematical definition, unless you want to, that's fine. But you don't have to, you can use just a, a nice sentence. That's also quite good. Go on. Huh? Go on. Go on. <laughs> well, you want more? I can put more problems that require you to. Or do you want worms too? I don't know what you guys have this fascination with worms. By the way, as usual, look out for red herrings. They are on the test. We've talked about red herrings before, I believe. <laughs> I don't think we have. What? I have no idea what you're talking about. Red, Colin? That exists. What's that? Red, I've heard that exists. Look it up. Tell them what it means. Well, red hair is like something you think is something else, but it's not what you think it is. Is that what Google says, or is that what you say? <laughs> it's not the, exactly the definition I would give. Yeah. Is that a cell phone? First you come in late, then you don't turn the cell phone off. I didn't come late. You didn't come late. All right. We're a half an hour late. I was a half an hour early, I guess. <laughs> in literature, red herring is a narrative element intended to distract the reader from a more important event in the plot you place with it. The term red herring originates from the tr tradition whereby young hunting dogs in Britain were trained to follow a scent with the use of a red herring. The sponge and fish would be dragged along the trail until the puppy learned to follow the scent. Later, when the dog was later when the dog was being trained to follow the faint odor of a fox or badger, the trainer would drag a red herring, which has a much stronger odor, across, across the animal's trail at right angles. The dog would eventually learn how to follow the original scent rather than the stronger scent. Very nice. Okay, you guys get the idea. You remember we had a problem, and I believe we even used this expression to describe it when I had you graph. Well, I don't remember the exact problem, but it looked something like this. This is a simplified version of it. 
and graph the absolute value of sine of x plus 4. Right. Now, what does sine of x look like? Well, you got this nice thing going up and down between 1 and minus 1. But when you add 4, it shifts the graph up by 4, right? So now it's going between 3 and 5. Okay, so when you take the absolute value, what happens? Nothing, right? Because it's between 3 and 5. So those absolute value signs are a red herring. They're there to make the problem look harder than it is and make you think, oh, there's something weird going on. But of course, this is equal to that. Okay, so that's a red herring. It's something which is just there to distract you and make you think, oh my gosh, this is hard, or oh my goodness, how am I going to deal with that? But then it turns out it has nothing to do with the problem. Right? It's, it's very easy. And, uh, I can already I can think of at least one red herring on the exam, so you got to look out. For it. Not two, really. Hey, that's what you mean by red herring. That's not correct at all. What do you mean it's not correct at all? Read red the definition herring, again. A red herring would more be like. Read the definition again. Would be like if you're trying if you give us a problem and we think we have to do it one way, but you actually have to do it both. No, 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 no. That's not a red herring. That's misdirection. That's not. That's uh, Joe Gibbs is running it. No, read read the definition again. Come on. Right, that's like the counter tray, right? Wikipedia is never wrong. Exactly. No, Wikipedia agrees with me. Read it. Read it again. Read not not the whole thing about the dogs. <laughs> that is kind of a red herring, <laughs> but not really. You know, I think when I get older, I will start drawing chalk at students, but not you guys. I like you. Well, I don't like all of you. There's at least one of you in here I don't like. Anybody want to guess? <laughs> Let's take a vote. Who do I not like in here? There's just one person. Wait, I like Kevin not here? Maybe I should turn off. <laughs> oh, is that still on? Oh my goodness. Hi, Dean. <laughs> Did you not find it yet? I, the internet died. Oh, the internet. Okay. Well, no, it, it, I was right. And, you were wrong. We'll just we'll leave it at that. Are we gonna have to graph things? You know, have to graph questions. Like what? you give us equation, question. find the graph, and then be like, what's the limit? But you have to make the graph yourself. Ooh, that's a good idea. No, please. That's a bad. Oh, I gotta make a note to myself. No, like I'm not even getting this. I have to. That and that may count as your submitted problem. That's a great idea. Yeah, I have to remember. When, then, when you have that problem on the exam, you know who to thank them. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm going to put on the test Stephanie's problem. <laughs> you can thank her. This one is worth most of the points. <laughs> if you graph it incorrectly, you fail. <laughs> I'm, I'm picking on you. I'm not being very nice. But you're not the one. I just want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> you're not the one he hates. Oh, thanks. You should say the math and, and stay away from that one, by the way. What? Did you find it? <laughs> you still not? I feel like other math classes have to worry about like the language barrier, and I just don't understand half the metaphors that you connect with. <laughs> so I guess I need to know. I really don't. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, half the metaphors that I use, I make up on the spot, and the, and half of those I intend to be complete nonsense. Look at this in the red herring, right? Is, is this is this oh face right off the trail of the actual fox? Yeah. So like the fox thinks it has to go that way and find that fox, but actually it's supposed to continue following this fox. Yeah. And in this problem, for instance. The absolute values make you think that the, the important part of this, right? Because you know what sine of x plus 4 is. The, idea the important part, oh my goodness, we've got to figure out what's happening to the absolute value of x. I'm totally going to argue this. You, you think, <laughs> you said that it has, has to do with difficulty, and makes students think it's harder than it is. That's not the point of it. Objection! Sustained? So, on what grounds, you know? I don't so we're not going to do any more calculus, can I leave? <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent question. If we're not going to do any more calculus, can, can Stephanie leave? Should we do some more calculus? We have five minutes. Let's, let's, uh, if you have no questions, we don't, I mean, I'm not going to answer any if you have none. 